He happens, totally coincidentally, to live quite near. Uh, he was one of the first people through the door when Gladys died. Although I was a little Tory boy, I used to go to things like Billy Bragg concerts. Yeah, and um, I used to love your speeches. I mean, you gave these... Inc I mean, I'm, I'm, be I'm sounding so facetious here because... Uh, it was a tough, tough fight. I was a friend of Frank Field. Frank Field was a family friend of ours. Yes. So I knew what... Uh, but your speech about militant, I mean, you, ha you are an incredible speaker and those are the things, the memories that stay with me from that time. Well, uh... You don't know what you, to say now. <laughs> no, I... I you, you, you do it because that's your duty in any case. Mm. I mean, in that particular instance and some others, I brought a particular passion to bear because they were infecting and seriously damaging the Labour Party, and that had to be stopped. Mm. And so it was as straightforward as that. But it was a year later than I wanted to do it because I was going to do it in 84. Mm. But we were in the middle of a miners' strike and an attack on militant, uh, the supreme anti-establishment uh, tendency, <clears throat> even though they pretended not to be an organisation, uh, would have just come off the hinges. So I had to exercise patience, something that my parents would never have recognised. But um, in the end, it was worth the wait. Uh, well, let's talk about contemporary politics now, because obviously uh, you keep a close eye uh, on that. Uh, in 1992, you were the Labour leader, uh, and... A lot of people thought uh, you were going to win that election. I didn't, but there you were. Yeah. But you didn't. Um, a lot of people, uh, Keir Starmer's team have been telling people not to be complacent. A lot of people assume Keir Starmer is going to win the next election. What are you thinking about at the moment as, as the election? This is the election year. First, uh, Keir has been absolutely right for two years, really, uh, to try to get don't be complacent tattooed on the inside of the eyelids of every body associated with the Labour Party because uh, it's killer. I mean, what prevented us from getting elected in 92 was not our complacency. In fact, we fought uh, house to house fighting literally uh, for years beforehand. It was the fact that not enough people believed that I should be Prime Minister in the end, partly because of policies, partly because of presentation, but partly also, I guess, uh, because of the negativity with which I'd been treated for years beforehand. Whatever it was, it was a combination of circumstances. And uh, I just wasn't good enough, strong enough, appealing enough to pull it off. So we got defeated, but it wasn't complacency. And now uh, what they've got to safeguard against is that absence of complacency, and it is zero complacency. There is none in the Labour Party. Nobody's taking anything for granted. Not sliding towards super uh, carefulness and caution because people in our country, rightly, are looking for substantial change. They don't expect it to come overnight or within a couple of years. But they do want to have the prospect of a substantial alteration in the condition of our country and our families and communities. And they're right to demand that. And Kia is utterly committed to that. And what he's got to spend the next six, nine, ten months doing is conveying that urgent sense of purpose, which he most definitely, as an individual, as well as a, a political leader, he's definitely got that. There's no question about it at all. Yeah, there is this, this kind of uh, strange spectrum, isn't there? There's the safety first, don't do anything that will frighten the horses and just hope the other side loses. Uh, there's the sort of policy, uh, he heavy, pragmatic yeah. approach. And then there's the kind of hope approach, which he sort of touched on in his New Year speech. I mean, is the, is the climate now so bad that you can't really be the hope candidate. You've just got to be the practical, I'm not going to mess things up candidate. Well, the difficulty of it is that there are legions of organised uh, 
resistors to the Labour Party, if I can call them that, uh, in especially the print media, uh, who will treat any shred of hope as daydreaming, unrealistic, unaffordable, and dismiss it and build in suspicion about the people who offer hope. And at the same time, and this is what makes it really difficult, a country that can't live with hopelessness and is seeking the prospect of real change. And I suppose the one word that sums that up is hope. And so consequently, you've got to appeal to a country that wants to absorb a sense of hopefulness, audacity, a prospect of change, mm. and at the same time do it in language and with policies that make it impossible for those stances to be represented as unrealistic and affordable. And that's the line that Labour's been treading now for a long time, just about two years, really. Uh, it's the correct line, and it's difficult to sustain simply in terms of its authenticity and the way in which you can convince people that whilst nothing that you're offering is unrealistic, undoable, unaffordable, we will always subject ourselves to the disciplines of decency and fiscal probity that make it a realistic prospect that this country can secure, adopt, adapt, and achieve very substantial change over a period of a few years. Now, Neil Kinnick, you spent a long time, the last four or five years, caring for your late wife, Glenys yeah. Kinnick, who was yeah. an unbelievably successful and impressive politician in, in her own right. And it's kept you, uh, quite understandably, that's been, that has been your absolute priority. And we very sadly uh, lost her a, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, how are you feeling about the future? Will you, um, uh, it sounds like odd to put it this way, but uh, will you be now putting your sh looking at uh, how you can get involved with the Keir Starmer? Yeah, yes, certainly. I mean, I'm... I've been uninvolved, mm. uh, partly because he's a very decent guy. He happens, totally coincidentally, to live quite near. Uh, he was one of the first people through the door when Gladys died. Were you first elected in 1970? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was 28 years of age, amazing. which is ridiculous. What is your? What do you like to think of as your legacy, or is there anything else that you would like to change? Well, it's been uh, torn a bit because I could have said to you fairly confidently uh, back in the late nineties um, that the people who said I made the Labour Party electable were right, um, and I used to distinguish by saying, "Yeah, yeah, 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 it was great," but. Tony Blair got it elected, and there's a hell of a difference. Um, then we've been through an interregnum, especially with Jeremy Corbyn, where the strengths that I tried to install got really tattered. Um, the party and its standing and respect for the Labour Party has been rebuilt mm -hmm. by uh, Keir Starmer and his current team, which is terrific. Um, so, legacy. God, I don't know. I, um, you'll have to ask them after I die. They'll tell you then. <laughs> uh, well, I think your legacy on this interview is that you're a wonderful man. It's been an absolute joy to interview you. I'm afraid to tell you that lots and lots of texts have come into the programme full of love and praise for you, Lord Kinnock. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you.